Good evening, and welcome to the Delta Group's uh, project number four about pragmatic influences and objections in education. Our focus when we look at this, not only is this our big group project, but again this week we were assigned by Dr. Lester to look more at pragmatic influences and objections in education. So our group members are Terry Hervey, Clint Maddox, Keelan Logan, and I'm Josh Hamilton. And as we go through the slides in this presentation, uh, we hope that you walk away from this learning a little more about how pragmatism has influenced education and some of the objections, and not just from a broad spectrum. Our goal is to break down certain elements of the schools and see how the pragmatic philosophy or how pragmatism and certain persons in pragmatism have helped develop what we know as the public school system today and how it's influenced education as we know it. So we're going to begin by looking at pragmatism and specifically the role of the school. So as you can see on the next slide, pragmatism and the role of the school. Uh, we have three key philosophers. There's many pragmatists that you can see in the book, uh, Philosophy and Foundations of Education. But when we look at these three, we highlight them because we think they're very important, specifically to the role of the school. Starting off with Dewey. Uh, Dewey's going to argue, quote, that the school should nurture the individual and social capacities. Essentially what Dewey is saying, these two are intertwined, the individual and the social. So we need to prep students for this lifelong citizenship and participation in the social society because they're so interlocked. Uh, Rousseau would say that child's interests should guide education, and so what the child is interested in and uh, things of that sort should guide education. And finally, Locke. We really like Locke because Locke argues, uh, and it's kind of a philosophy for pragmatism or a basis, that we're all um, this tabula rasa type of mind or a blank slate in which that through experience and other matters, uh, the mind is imprinted on. So we start as this blank slate, Locke said, and then we are imprinted on. Uh, moving to the next slide, let's talk about intrinsic motivation. When we talk about intrinsic motivation, uh, we can see that children have an inherent motivation to learn. Uh, teachers should capture this and use motivation that already exists. At least we hope that we're doing in this class, doing this in the classroom, right? Um, again, back to the role of the teacher a little bit, or the role of the school, is to guide the students to make these connections in each of their lives with the material being covered. It's this very uh, real world applicable, when are we ever going to use this philosophy? And then when we call our students to participate in a group discussion where everyone participates, the teacher tries to create an environment of learning based on education on each student's comments. This is really important and it allows students to be interested or vested in the curriculum that's being covered when we allow everyone to participate in these group discussions to make them feel like their comments and their opinion really matters. And that's very uh, pragmatic or a pragmatic philosophy. Um, not only do we need to look at that, but if we go to the next slide, let's talk a little bit about field trips. I know what you're thinking. We never take field trips at my school. But uh, when we talk about pragmatism, we should talk about field trips. So when we look at field trips, uh, the pragmatist philosophy would say that attention has to be given to linking life experience with other experience. So education should be uh, studied scientifically, but also socially or how we live socially. We can't separate experience from nature. This was a really uh, big push amongst many of the philosophers when we look at pragmatism, especially the three that we mentioned earlier, um, Louis, excuse me, Locke, Dewey, and Rousseau, and that this interaction provides growth. Uh, field trips came about when teachers tried to link this real world education uh, to the classroom. And so that's really in pragmatism when we see field trips really start to blossom is when we try to make this connection between experience and uh, social society. You can also look at William James who talks about a lot about experience. So that's kind of where field trips started. Your next slide looks at proactive learning. Now when we talk about proactive learning, uh, pragmatists put heavy emphasis on teaching that promotes an active role for the students. I think you're probably getting that just at this point, but a few key things to point out. Um, the evidence of discovery is on the standardized tests. Ironically, standardized tests are thought of as weak for pragmatists. However, um, there's particular aspects which are incorporated into everyday teaching. We give our students today, like the questions lean more towards how and why and more impact on the finding of solution than group memorization. Um, evidence and discovery on the standardized tests, if you think if you're an English teacher, when they give them these open-ended persuasive questions, this is proactive learning. We're, we're pushing them to think of the how and the why, and then they get graded on that. So as much criticism as pragmatists would give standardized tests, we are attempting, at least here in Texas with uh, TACS and now the New Star program, maybe to try to give students a little more of a pragmatic 
type of standardized test. Now, when we look at teacher growth, uh, many people can teach by lecture. Um, they promote memorization. We can see students are being pacifists. But pragmatist model calls for much more than the teacher just giving a good amount of knowledge. Um, there's a high pedagogy for applying the material to the students. Um, we need to see evidence in performing activities, understanding the topics, presenting topics, and then students go and seek out solutions. Um, not all like rubrics, if you're using a, using a rubric for this type of activity, require the same method, but an example of using this would be you know, using a rubric for an activity where students come up with topic questions and seek out solutions to problems. And so uh, teacher grows because the teacher is not just in control anymore. I know, it's scary. But we let the students now take control of their own learning and pragmatism and let them discover some things and ask questions on topics. Slide six, we're going to go back to standardized testing and look at it specifically as a slide. We talked a little bit about it just a minute ago, about how the STAR and the tax can promote this higher level pedagogy. But at the same time, uh, there's an objection here for pragmatism. We have to point out some of the objectives. So as we mentioned earlier, this discovery for pragmatism and standardized tests. However, the overarching goal of individuality amongst these tests has really weakened pragmatist in education. What we mean by that is pragmatists encourage students to worry more about the success of the group rather than the sex success of the individual. Um, therefore, with curriculum-based tests, I mean, we don't even have to look at the tax. The SAT, the ACT, all of those are standardized tests as well. And those, as much as we want to say we're promoting is for the greater good and for the whole school to show that we've learned something, really what a standardized test is about is for the individual's success and sadly about their failure and how big those are. So pragmatists would definitely object to this style of testing. And so that's really key to point out. Although there's some good, that's a huge objection by pragmatists. Now you're looking at problem solving uh, in a practical setting. Pragmatists are concerned with teaching children how to solve problems in a real life situation. Um, examples like in my own classroom, um, we do different types of things where we look at um, legislation and things that are being debated and current events, but like that's, I have a special situation. But like a math curriculum, for example, includes problems and solutions of real life situations. Uh, an example, uh, problems figuring the number of gallons a car uses if it gets a certain number of miles per gallon and you have to travel a certain number of miles. Or in science, the various types of energy used, how it's produced, is it reusable? How can society push this so we don't use all of our non-renewable resources? All of these, I mean, if you want a math and science example, there are two great examples of how pragmatists can take a real-life problem-solving scenario and put it into these math and science classes and make it practical for students to learn and see the value in. The last slide we're, last slide we're looking at is um, a diverse curriculum. Why we titled it that is because pragmatists believe in diverse curriculum. Schools today, especially in the higher levels, uh, include a wide range of courses in, additional, in addition to the three R's that we're all aware of. Um, these include art, family and consumer science, theater arts, choir, band, my favorite, debate, uh, speech communication, orchestra, there's all types of examples. But this kind of diverse curriculum is really important when it comes to when it comes to pragmatism because we know that pragmatists are going to push for students to look at the social components and these types of classes like family and consumer science and the arts and band and all of these are incorporated into the larger society and I think all too often people forget that it's not just math, science, English, history are our four core classes that make a good curriculum and make a well-rounded student. We have to remember to diversify and prepare our students, at least in the pragmatist sector, to be prepared for the real world. So really just to recap what we've looked at. Today we've looked at um, how pragmatism is alive and well in education and some of the objections it's had. Specifically, we looked at some of the key philosophers. We talked about William James and his idea of experience. We talked about Dewey, who argues that the individual and the social capacities are intertwined. Rousseau, and that child interest has to be guided by learning. And this idea from Locke that our mind is this blank slate that's now going to be imprinted on through experience and education. We also talked about some objections that pragmatists would have, specifically about standardized tests and focusing in um, on the individual. 
And so, you know, when it, when it comes to this, there's always good and bad to any philosophy when we talk about education. But when we as a group sat down and discussed this, we all agreed that pragmatist philosophy, if we're really teaching students to be lifelong learners and members of society, has some really great attributes. So we hope you, do, we hope you learn something from this as well.